Hello and welcome back everybody to the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and this is episode 125. Um, that's not bad. Uh, as I was told not long ago, most podcasts don't make it to number seven. So, you know, we're sneaking up on that, uh, what, uh, eighth, eighth of a thousand number, which is not bad. Uh, today, there's just a reminder that uh, we do have the new uh, uh, discount code. Uh, if you put the word new year, one word, new year, uh, as you go into the code, discount code, uh, you get a really good price. Um, it's an introductory offer and, you know, try out the workout generator, hang out in the forum, you know, meet some people, uh, read the, the library of things that we have in the downloads, lead the, uh, read the articles. There's a lot of material there. Uh, the programs are good. They're, uh, they're real programs <laughs> done by real people over time. And I think that's, uh, uh, an important thing. Uh, we've had a lot of success with athletes of all kinds, normal people, general population, uh, the elderly, uh, like myself, I guess, and uh, enjoy, uh, learn something. Uh, also, too, we have a new course that just came out. Uh, it's called Game Changers. Uh, Alex posted this thing about how he'd be interested in to hearing more about the Game Changers in my life, and it was strange at first because I was like, well, I feel like I've already done that. But then once we started having the conversation there on the forum between Alex and me, and then I talked to Brian, and then all of a sudden we realized that even though you, I may have written about a lot of things, I've never really talked about certain things that really made my life as a coach and athlete much better. And so this first course has just come out, Game Changers 1. Um, by the way, don't forget if you're a member, it's half off, which is a really good price. Um so uh, check it out. Uh, a couple of the topics include, well, obviously some of the more famous stories like getting the Sears bar in 1965, but some of the things about equipment and uh, just, I'm thinking about a collar especially, and, and some of the other things that as I've been doing this, I've been pulling my old journals out and just flipping through the pages and realizing that stuff like the Romanian deadlift, which I actually saw Nico Vlad do, uh, have been in my notebooks for years and years and years. And I've been teaching the ideas from this, but I haven't really shared them because I, I felt like, well, everybody knows that. And then I'll write something on the forum, I'll have a conversation, and people will say, well, Dan, we weren't at the Olympic Training Center in 1990 and 1991 watching these great lifters and throwers train. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. And I think that's the real uh, benefit of you doing your own game changers too. Uh, the thing I've noticed the most about this, and it's kind of a nice thing, is almost everybody who writes their game changer stories in the forum uh, names names. Uh, and it's a kind of a fun way to remind yourself uh, that you're not alone on this beautiful uh, blue-green orb. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people that have influenced you and have made a difference in your lives. And it's just kind of a nice reminder um, it's interesting because some people will say just a small little thing about this person or that person. And it's just nice to remember that. Well, let's get to the questions and let's start today's podcast. Our first question is from Ted. And I have to tell you, uh, what's nice about this question is that Ted answers it himself probably better than I can. So let's go. I've just started a new hobby, archery. Um, archery is an underlaid, underrated art form, an underrated sport, and really an important part of uh, world history. And uh, it's nice to see you picking up on it. What would you recommend as a GPP supplementary training for this sport in the weight room? So basically, how do you lift weights? Until now, my gym, sh my gym session consists of power snatch and overhead squat combination. We used to call that the exercise. One power snatch, one overhead squat, the, another power snatch, another overhead squat. It's, I uh, worked with a young American football player who called it the exercise and told me at the end of the season that that's the reason he broke all these records. And I still think there's value to it. Snatch grip deadlift, 
bench press plus one arm row and bat wings. That's I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's when you do the isometric hold in the top with your thumb and your armpit. So I'm rowing, thumbs go into the armpits, I hold, and then I squeeze my elbows together. So far, I feel good. The snatch variations I've chosen, uh, I've chosen as it feels good and activates the upper back and shoulder stability. Um, I mean, maybe add the ab wheel or uh, a hanging uh, bent knee raise. But honestly, Ted, this is pretty good. I, I don't know why you'd want to vary much from that. That's, I mean, you've got a you've got an excellent over whole body power move. You've got a great deadlift variation. I think the snatch grip deadlift is great. Bench and rows, I mean, that's just a classic. That's pretty good. And by I got to tell you, from what I've seen, pretty good is better than 99% of the crap you'll ever see in your life. Um, so, Ted, I'm just giving you a big old thumbs up. And I, I, I'd like to hear more about where you're heading on this, uh, on your archery. Uh, because, uh, I mean, it's a great sport. And, you know, it's kind of nice to see movies nowadays uh, it seems like they're hiring people who know something about archery when they do movies uh, you know i like the the disney movie brave a lot and i saw a thing on youtube that talked about how accurate that the archery scenes were in the show uh the bad archery and the good archery which i thought was kind of fun well ted thank you great question and uh keep me informed okay thank you we have a question from vince vince says in the fitness community we see so many people promoting different training routines and preaching different information all the time. And more often than not, these so-called fitness experts seem to contradict one another. Yeah, but don't forget, contradiction's okay. Uh, it provides the rub of the thing, uh, that which you know allows you to move forward. With so much conflicting information out there, things have got a bit overwhelming when it comes to my own training. And I've been guilty in the past of being one of those people that has program hopped way too often which consequently leads to very minimal results in the gym. However, I have always liked the idea of minimal training. For example, heading to the gym every day and focusing on only exercises and movements which matter most to me. For me personally, those movements would be an overhead press, chin up, weighted step up, and also weighted carries. I also enjoy walking, running, and swimming. Well, that's a, I mean, I don't, weighted step ups uh, are some people don't don't like them. Uh, I but I mean your press, chin up, step up, weighted carries, walk, run, swim. A pretty good program there, I think, huh? I mean, Vince, that's that's really good. Uh, my question is, instead of following conventional programs, do you think it's possible for me to only perform these exercises for the rest of my life? Well, I mean, I don't know about for the rest of your life. I mean, I, you know, things do change, man. I mean, a life you know, you might move to a desert with no swimming pools or uh, uh, bodies of water. Uh, but yeah, I I think there's a genius in all, you know, I mean, you have to make sure at some level, you got to make sure you push, pull, hinge, squat, load, and carry. I mean, you got to make sure you do those fundamental human movements. Uh, um, get up and up, down off the ground. Uh, you got to drink water. You got to eat protein. You got to eat veggies, I think, uh, at some level. You got to sleep, Okay. But after that, you know, if you're if you're if you're ticking the boxes, you know, yeah, if, I, I think there's a genius. In fact, when I do workshops, one of the things I tell people a lot is, you know, if you don't like this exercise, well, stop doing it. Pick the one, you know, pick something similar and do that. Uh, I learned the same thing. You know, yeah, for anybody who's been around a long time like me, you get to the point one day it's like. Um, I don't like the way I feel after bench presses. Uh, you know, I get that real soreness right in there. And I don't need to impress anybody else ever again with my bench press. And frankly, no one cared anyway, which is a hard lesson for all of us to learn. And I started doing those one-arm bench presses. And after a couple of years of doing, the, you know, adding those in as a, as a spice on top, I started taking them kind of seriously. And I asked myself, why have I not been doing this my entire career? So yeah, I like the idea. So I'm answering two questions. Uh, first, the the first question is, is it okay just to do things you like? Absolutely. Um, when I look at the programs that I do best on, generally it looks something along, 
I squat snatch. I like doing that a lot. I overhead press. I like doing that a lot. I like doing uh, hip thrusts and those kind of uh, Brett Contreras glute stuff. I like that a lot. And when I'm uh, and a weight, a loadly, a, the loaded carries, oddly, I like those a lot. When I see myself kind of, that is the, uh, the bulk of what I do. I, I see progress during those periods and I see myself enjoying training. When I do a bunch of crap I don't like, uh, it, it doesn't happen in the first 20 days or 60 days or six weeks or whatever, but it does. It starts to really starts to, uh, to wear on me. I was looking at some programs I was doing about, oh, it would have been about 2013, uh, 2013, 2014, 2015, and they were good programs. Oh, they were good, but I wasn't making progress because I didn't like the bulk of the things I was doing. So yeah, I think this is a good idea. I think it's a very good idea. In fact, uh, you know, I'm I'm wondering if you should write a book on this because it's pretty good. You know, do what you like. You know, you know. But here's the thing: you got to do. You got to the the do part is the key. You know, uh, and if you like it, that's that's just wonderful. Great question. Thank you. We have a question from Steve. I currently live in Manhattan and I spend a lot of time there, and I work a lucrative job that I enjoy. That also gives me a good work-life balance. Well, and I'd stop right there. You're doing great. I have friends and stay healthy in shape. The one problem is I'm still single and I'm and I obsess and frustrated by it and frustrated by it. I go on many dates and have had some girlfriends throughout my 20s, but nothing lasted more than a year. I'm going to be turning 30 this summer and I can't help but wonder what's wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. I am picky, but I also feel like I'm falling behind in life. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I, I remember being probably twenty-seven or twenty-eight and thinking, I want to be a dad, and that wouldn't happen for me at the time for five to seven more years, and I did. I so, I'll, I'll be honest, Steve. There's there's a there's a bit of me that's like, uh, and I'm sure some of the listeners are the same way. It's like, hey, you're doing fine. You know, what are you complaining about? But there's also a bit of me who completely understands w what you're going on, you know, and I I feel sometimes um, we cheat a little bit. Uh, it, there's a scene in Moonstruck that's, you know, it's the scene at the restaurant where the professor is breaking up with the girlfriend. And it's, n nobody's the good guy in the story, but one of the things that um, I've referenced years later was, you know, when I became the professor, when I became the person in their 60s with all those multiple income streams, you know, I would look back on people in their 20s and be like, oh, you, you know, what do you, you don't even know what you're, and then I had to break myself and stop myself because I think what you're saying is very valid here. Um, you know, finding a, finding a, a partner, a, a, a person that, you know, you know, you're, you're willing to, to, uh, you know, walk, uh, through the highs and lows of life. And there, there are highs and lows, um, you know, somebody that you, you trust, you know, somebody that, uh, if you go on a road trip and uh, there's a leak in the house, you know, that the leak will get fixed, you know, uh, <laughs> if there's flooding in the basement, they don't just close the door and wait until you get back. Uh, somebody will take care of your pet while you're gone. You know, those, those are tough things. And of course, someone that you 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 want to have children with and make there's lots of sacrifices to having little ones, and it, it doesn't seem to end. Uh, I I don't, Steve. I don't think you're falling behind. Uh, I don't. I, since I don't know know you, uh, but since you, since I get a sense you you know who who I am, um, that makes that makes for tough advice. But um, I guess the only thing I can tell you is that I, I understand what you're saying, and I'm walking with you, and I appreciate you uh, sharing this with me and the whole world because this is uh, this can be a weird thing. You know, you'll have friends who are married. Oh, there's all kinds of shows. How I Met Your Mother does this a, a lot. You know, there's the married guy. Uh, the, Go go watch the episodes with the bachelor parties, you know, where there's always that one married guy. Ha ha ha! This is the last time you'll do this, and he just they're just mean and rude. And that's that's not that's not really an accurate 
vision of most marriages that I know. That's certainly, I guess. So. Um, well, listen, um, I I can't I can't give you advice, advice, but all I can just tell you is that there are many wonderful people on this planet Earth, and um, if if you feel like it's time to move into a you know uh, a full a full relationship with with all the joys and all the sorrows, um, it, it'll show. It'll show in your life, and I wouldn't be surprised that uh, in in the blink of an eye that uh, all your dreams come true, um, especially the real dreams, the ones you didn't even know you had. I I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a question from Tara, and Tara says this. I am hoping you can describe your writing habit. What time of day? Laptop, desktop, or paper and pen, pencil? How do you approach writing a wandering weights, for example? Do you make an outline or just stream of consciousness? How do you categorize and organize each piece of writing? Wow, you're, you're assuming a whole bunch of things that may or may not be true. Do you ever dabble in fiction? Uh, I'll answer that. Yes, I, ha I am, and I can talk to you about the end of this. If any of this is too much prying, I understand your hesitance to reveal your secrets. And finally, which writers do you admire and who has influenced your writing? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, uh, throwers throw, jumpers jump, you know, sprinter sprint, swimmer swim, bikers bike. So I think writers write. Um, the, the best thing I think you can do is, uh, in, it's easier now, but I, I'm still a, big fan of uh, jotting ideas and notes down as they come to me. Uh, I have an, on my phone, I have that notes thing. But what I find with my notes is I'll come up with an idea and I'll go, you know, write a book about Olympic lifting and why it's so good. But then I'll look at the note a few days later and, you know, the, my talk to text will say, buy cantaloupes and bananas at the store and feed the dog. And it's like, we'll do it. Yeah. Um, there is uh, the number one thing I would, if you, I, I think writings is the most difficult part of it, but just like every other art form is the discipline. I think you need a great amount of discipline to be a writer and only the idea of discipline as constantly coming back and working on it. Um, one thing I like to do is, okay, so I, I think a ritual is important. So when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I put on my headphones and I do a 15-minute meditation. The one I'm doing right now is called rain reflection. And it's a breathing. It's the, the, There's rainfall in the head and there's breathing. Um, I think it's important for me to practice getting deeper into my head. Um, I make coffee before I go to bed. So I wake up and I have coffee ready to go. Mm, delicious. And uh, I answer my emails first. I answer anything that comes up on any social media. Um, I don't do business the first thing in the morning. Oh, I, I might talk to Brian about uh, uh, Dan John University, but I don't do business. And then what I do is ideally I will have something I'm working on. Boy, that's the easiest. If I'm working on a book, Oh, well, that's easy because then I just know. Um, one thing I do that is kind of different than most maybe is I would I would never start a book with uh, page one or a conclusion. Uh, I, I, I just knock down as many as the low-hanging fruits as I can. Um, if I'm writing a book about, yeah, <clears throat> 40 Years of the Whistle, I think one of the first things I wrote was uh, Dick Knottmeyer and the Pacific Barbell Club because that's so it was just so easy. I think I had 10 pages of writing on the very first day because I just talked about that. I talked about Ralph Mon. I talked, you know, some of the other harder stuff later on I, I would put off. A um, couple of my books, Attempts did this, Intervention. Intervention is probably has 400 pages of stuff that's not in the book. Uh, I have a whole book called Reasonableness that's not ever been published. I, I've sent it to a few of my friends and I've gotten some nice feedback and mostly thank you so much. <clears throat> oh, that is one thing. Um, people say that they want to read your stuff, but they don't. Uh, they don't. Your, your friends don't want to read your books. People who say, I'll read it and give you some feedback. Uh, never, not, well, that's not true. Uh, I do have a, a, a Navy friend. He's an officer who has sent me great, 
uh, reflections. But most of the time you get very, very little feedback. Um, so have a ritual, get writing, take down the low hanging fruits first as best you can. Um, and then what happens is, um, just like when you go to the gym every day for 4,000 days in a row, going 4,001 is a lot easier than going to the gym on day one. So day 4,001 is much easier. Um, if you're going to decide to eat vegetables at every meal, it's much easier five years down the road than it is today. Um, writing has a momentum, a snowball effect. So once you start to write, you write. Uh, I'm a real big believer in rewriting. Uh, I go back and uh, now sometimes when I was writing, like when I was writing for Men's Health and I was doing that weekly thing, um, it got to be a bit of a game at the end because they weren't uh, posting them in a timely manner. You know, I set them, you know, 100 plus articles and I think they only published a few, though they asked for a weekly thing. I'm not ripping on Men's Health. This is what it was. And I, what I would do was I, would, but what was great about that is that was a prompt, a daily prompt for me to write. So I would just spitball a whole bunch of ideas. Uh, my new game changer course, um, Brian and I talked on the phone and I just started writing down these ideas. And then we, uh, we hung up and I started writing and within three days, I probably had 200 pages of writing because of that process. Um, those things seem to help. I'll tell you one other thing that you didn't ask about, but walking is, so if if you get stuck as a writer anytime, pop up and walk. Uh, uh, writing, I, there's all kinds of articles over at Lit Hub on walking and writing. And, and I just, you just can constantly will find that walking just illuminates you as, an, uh, as a writer. Um, how do I categorize and organize things? Well, since I've written, say, I've published articles on Beowulf, King Arthur, uh, religious studies, religious education, a lot on religious education, um, discus throwing, throwing in general, Olympic lifting, and then fitness articles. Sometimes, sometimes I look at uh, the piece of writing very much like I would look at a season, uh, an athletic season. So, you know, there's going to be this build up. There's going to be this, you know, you know, general training, you know, there's going to be a lot of competition prep, uh, preparation. And there's going to be this easing off after the season is over where the real lessons happen. I just described how I write an article right there. I mean, it's just like what we learned in the third grade. Uh, yeah, I did dabble in fiction. Uh, when I left one job, I came back a day later with, uh, with one of these little, one of these little sticks. And I said, uh, I just want to pull off all my personal files. And this guy, the geek, uh, the computer guy said, oh, I just deleted everything. So, you know, the same guy who couldn't show up, you know, for six and seven weeks when nothing was working in your computer. The one time he was actually efficient was was killing, uh, and I was up to probably in the mid 400s on a book about fiction. It's it was a story of a school teacher who, because of a series of events, had to lay low and come up with a new identity. And when he comes up with a new identity in a in a big city, um, he gets discovered by people who are always always watching and waiting. Uh, and it's a whole group of people who uh, wa watch everybody and just want information. And the, because he's a school teacher, he's a great conduit of information. Because when you're a school teacher, you know everything about everybody. Because people, for whatever reason, think teachers can't hear. And I, I, I tell you, I know stories about many families because the kids would tell each other stuff, and I could hear it clearly. And it was a fun little story. There was a, there was a, uh, a weird little. I wouldn't say it's a chase where he was trying to find a place. And yeah, it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of fun, and it's all gone. Yeah, but yes, I have. But thank you for asking. Uh, what writers do you admire, and who has influenced your writing? Well, writers I admire. Um, well, I, I like. I, I do like. 
I, I like a writer who can, you know, just take me to another place. That's why I like Dune. I like kind of Monte Cristo. I like the sword and the stone. Um, I, I like books that, um, have invent a whole world. You know, that's what the Bernie Rodenbar, uh, the burglar who series, you know, even though it's New York, he's invented a whole subculture inside of New York with characters. I look forward to meeting again. Um, Lillian Jackson Brown series before it went terrible at the end there. The cat who, the cat who read backwards, the cat who turned on and off, you know, uh, invented a whole little world of people that you cared about. And I, I like writers who do that. Um, I'm a, you know, obviously I'm a big fan of some of Hemingway's works. Uh, I, I do. Um, so T.H. White, Hemingway, obviously, uh, Any any time an author can uh, you know kind of make a world for me, and 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 make me smarter on the tail end of the book, I, I always like that. Uh, even if it's just smarter as in the way humans interact, you know. Um, one area I don't think most people know is I'm a big lover of short stories. Um, the Irish short story writers uh, of the past twenty years, maybe even longer. It's just been a remarkable period. Here's my here's why I love short stories, uh, Tara. Is that uh, even if you don't like the story, you know, it's you only have a few more pages, so it's not bad. I hope that helped, and thank you. It's very kind of you to ask. Okay, we have a question from Hunter. Hunter says this: I have a bunch of different kettlebells, a couple sets of doubles, different size singles, as we all do, a TRX tire, and a sledgehammer. Homemade sandbags, some, be careful with those homemade sandbags. Some, you always end up with sand everywhere. Some bands and a pull-up dip tower, I've got that, in my home gym, but no barbell. Just trying to stay generally fit and build some muscle strength. Would you suggest a push-pull, squat, hinge, carry type of program a few days a week? Hunter, I suggest that to everybody. That is what I suggest. Three days a week, push-pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry. Uh, one or two days a week, you know, get some mobility work in, take a nice sauna, stretch out, go for a walk every day, take your bike out for a ride, go play catch with a friend. Um, do you suggest rotating through each exercise as a set or better do all sets of each exercise before moving on to next exercise? So if you go, if you go like this, put a push, a pull, a hinge, a squat, a load of carry. A push, a pull, a hinge, a squat, a load of carry. A push, a pull, a, a hinge, a squat, a load of carry. And that was your three sets. That can be done. Um, most people don't have the focus and concentration to have the quality reps. So what I would recommend you do, and it's pretty simple for me to say this, Hunter, is just go to the workout generator at Dan John University. That's what it's designed for. You're going to put in your equipment that you use, and then it's going to spit out a three-day-a-week program for you that does push, pull, hinge, squat, load, and carry, plus mobility, plus stretching, plus options. So since you have a sandbag, well, you know, a TRX and a sandbag, you know, just those two alone, that's an odd combination. But you can do a lot of amazing things with those two things. Well, the nice thing about the workout generator, it's going to spit out a lot of ideas. You're going to have constant variation in your Monday, Wednesday, day one, day two, day three workouts. Uh, your weeks will be a little bit different. Your months will be a little bit different. And your options for your exercises will be a little bit different. So I think you, uh, Hunter, you're in a win-win situation. Um, the workout generator is perfect for you. And, and again, somebody got on me about selling this stuff online, but for God's sakes, I mean, there are people that will go with their programs. You listen to their on their webcasts and when they do podcasts, they're like, well, the only thing you need is this. And it's, of course, it's their product. And uh, the funny thing about on their forums is, is you have a whole bunch of people going right on, follow the program, right on, just do the program, do the program, the program, the program. And it's like, if I mention it, it's like, oh yeah, you're a shill. Yeah, okay. Well, so Hunter, I'm a shell. Sign up, danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, new year, make it one word. You get a third off. I mean, it's a third the price of normal. And, you know, uh, keep going. Uh, do you need a barbell? Not with the equipment you have. You're doing pretty well. I mean, long term, it might be something. If you get a good deal, that's that's what I do. I mean, I don't, I don't go 
looking for something. I wait until someone wants to get rid of it. Hey, good question. Thank you. We have a quick question from uh, Dave. And Dave says, you've often mentioned being a fan of Rusty Moore's work for folks whose goals align with his programs. Based on your recommendations, I did purchase one of his program uh, products. I, I wish you'd have told me which one, Dave, but uh, it's okay. I was wondering if you can talk more about what you like in his programs and why you recommend them and what your specific takeaways are. You know, um, it's I wasn't, I should have prepared myself a little better, but uh, um, so with Rusty Moore, my friend, um, <laughs> I have in here, I have documents. Uh, this document is, um, it's 25 pages of notes I've taken on Rusty's articles and, uh, and places. That's one of three of these that I have in my computer. Uh, what I like about Rusty Moore and what I like about Greg O'Gallagher is the two of them both have very specific programs for very specific needs. Uh, I'm a, well, let's, you, you asked about Rusty Moore, so let's focus there. The thing I like about Rusty is he's the person that convinced me to look closer at fermented foods. Even though I had all that research in front of me, he made it easy for me to <laughs> digest. Uh, when I, I, I slice up cucumbers now and I, and I soak them in uh, 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 rice vinegar for a while. And the reason I do that is because, you know, um, there's something magical in, in vinegar that's supposed to be good for me because I'm trying to get my body weight down. Well, that's Rusty Moore's idea. Uh, lift, then walk. That's Rusty Moore's idea. Uh, I have all of his programs, I think. Yeah, I do. Including the kettlebell one, which is fine. Uh, lightning rounds, I, I'm training that. I'm going to start training that way every winter. I've been doing that for, gosh, uh, since the book came out. Um, you know, like the high-carb book, I, you know, I read that book, and I got to tell you, it challenged my core beliefs. But then I looked at it, and I said, "Well, listen, you know, if you're eating, if you're eating a lot of veggies, you know, you're eating higher carb." And I, so sometimes I, I uh, oh, his his books on 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 building, basically that's power to the people by Pavel. I mean, you see that the, what I like about Rusty is that he connects the dots for me. Uh, I'm not dumb, but I think what Rusty does so well because he is so focused on looking good in photos you know he's he's the yacht body guy he's the you know he's the look like a runway he's the a wedding prep guy you know my problem is i'm working with throwers i'm working with football players i'm working with uh, military guys i'm working with general population i get a little i mean i'm all over the place but what's good about rusty is this is who he focuses on with greg o'gallagher if you want to look good at a pool on spring break greg o'gallagher is your guy if you want to win the fight at spring break, you come see me. It's, you know, maybe that was inappropriate, but it's true. Okay. Um, so it, it is all, you know, it, so that's why I, I like to encourage people to look at the work of Rusty. I have found Rusty Moore's work it, to be right. R I G H T. Um, I, I have taken so many of his ideas. It's funny. I'm just kind of spitting through here and, um, there's a couple of things I've tried. I did his potato hack. That's basically where you eat potatoes for 48 hours for a photo shoot. And man, it worked wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, it looked like I had lost weight, which is never a bad idea. Um, I'm just scrolling through here and just kind of l laughing at how many of these things that I, uh, that I like so much. Um, you know, he's look at this workout. He, he recommends one of his workouts. 10 rounds of shoulder presses, 10 rounds of push-ups, 30 rounds of kettlebell snatches, and then go for a 30-minute walk. I mean, come on. I mean, that's one of his three workouts in the week. Well, here's his, the other one because someone's going to ask. Um, 10 rounds of rows, 10 rounds of curls, 5 rounds of ab wheel rollouts, which is harder than you think, uh, kettlebell th uh, swings for 30 minutes, and then walk for 30 minutes. I mean, come on. Those are... Those are doable, repeatable workouts. They're realistic, and, and that's why I think I like them so much. So, yeah, I, I'm a big fan. And, and thank you for asking. Um, you know, I don't have any, uh, I, don't, I don't have affiliates or anything with any of these guys. I don't because I think that would be, you know, 
I don't like it. I don't like having being self-serving, but boy, it's it's good stuff. Everything I've read from Rusty, yeah, I I can't think off the top of my head that I, something I read from Rusty that didn't turn out to be real and true and work. That's pretty good. Now, <laughs> if you want to look good on a yacht, go see Rusty. If you want to knock people down, you come see me. Make sure you keep those separations in your head. Uh, and by the way, it is possible to look good and move good and knock people down good, but it is hard. Okay, thank you. Great question, Dave, and thank you so much. And a shout out to my friend, Rusty Moore. We got a question here from Jim. Is there any great difference between a power clean from the floor versus the hang for a non-competitive lifter? The only difference is that you have to... Uh, you got to get the bar up there somehow, either blocks or racks, or you deadlift it and then you slide it down. And I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just another thing you have to figure out and learn. I mean, I, I learned them from the floor, so it's easy for me. I'm going to build a program around the power clean. Cool. Push press and front squat and just want to get some clarity on the difference, if any. Well, I, I would say do them from the floor in this case. Only because that would be also your, uh, um, that would be a deadlift-like movement. M remember, start slow, finish fast, okay? Start slow, finish fast on those. Uh, do you have any thoughts on a goal for the Nieder press? Uh, Bill Nieder, or Nieder, was a, a, a great shot putter. And he used to do this, he would stand up and do this standing bench press, which is now called the Nieder press. My coach, Coach Mom, thought it was probably the best thing throwers could do. So we had this rusty old crappy 110 pound, I mean, uh, to call it a barbell is, is, is offensive, but, and he had us do this like this. And then my senior year, he figured out that just pick it up and throw it was better. And that was a great idea. And as everybody can figure out how long did that barbell last after we started throwing it? You're right. But, um, I said 110, and I was a Division I uh, MVP, and I struggled with 110 pounds in the year past. Uh, when I was in school and we did it uh, at Southwood, Coach Freeman showed me the exercise, and we played around with it. I don't know if I did more than 45. So that's important, uh, Jim. 45 to 110 is – so you're, you're, you're not – I mean, if someone's going to eat, someone always goes into the comments and says, you know, I did it 405 for eight, you know, because, because people are full of shit. Um, but um, I, I think it would be a good challenge to work up to, but was unable to find any numbers to work for. Was thinking about somewhere between 25% and 50% of body weight. Yeah, that would actually, that's not bad. I mean, that, that 50%, you know, when I was at Utah State, yeah, the 110 would have been right around that. I weighed uh, between 100 and 105 kilos most of the time, uh, 220 to 231. Uh, yeah, so, but try air light for the first few weeks. Oh, and the other thing, uh, when you do it, you snap it out and you pull it back in. Don't hang out at the vertical. Um, it just, it's boom, uh, it really hurts your shoulders. I, I, I don't know if it injures your shoulders, but it jacks your shoulders up pretty much to, to, if you hold it out there. Good. Three, in your article, minimal, Minimalist Mobility, you recommend, recommend the stony stretch and the windmill stick. Would you make any additions now? I am thinking you will answer the hang, but was wondering if there's other, uh, others. Yeah, the problem is now that I've added two more, uh, now I've got four and I can never teach anything with four. Um, so the stony stretch, you know, if you do the stony stretch, you're basically doing the hang and the bottom position of the goblet squat, basically. So if the most people can't do the stony stretch right, so maybe we could just say this, the hang, the bottom position of the goblet squat, and the windmill stick. Um, <clears throat> the windmill stick is just a great daily uh, assessment, so that's kind of why I like it, but... That's a good question, yeah. So the hang, yeah, you're right. It would be the hang, but there's no, yeah, I, 
when you're talking about minimalism, you, you always get stuck in that idea is I want to be minimalist to answer your question. But at the same time, I see all the flaws in what I just said. So before, before people start writing right down there, remember, I'm answering a very specific question about minimalism. As I follow up, most people don't ever listen to the entire uh, videos here. So it really doesn't matter what I'm saying right now. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Good series of questions here, Jim. We've got a question from Jack. And Jack says, Dan, how do you, can you find a balance in a program between the RKC hard style kettlebell training and Olympic lifting in a way that they complement each other? During the first lockdown in the UK, I found a kettlebell training extremely beneficial and embraced the philosophy similar to Pavel's of training almost every day without ever really fatiguing during a session. However, coming out of the lockdown, I decided to try some Olympic lifting and adding it to my program. I am receiving some coaching on my technique and mobility still, so huge lifts aren't really my goal at the moment, although I'd like to see my lifts improve. I wonder if you would know of an optimal way, if there's such a thing, to balance these two methodologies and if they can complement each other. Well, all I can say is this, is that's exactly what I do. It's exactly what I do. Uh, I share my workouts on the forum, at, and uh, I think it's called Dan John's Lifting, Learning, and everything else, or some silly thing like that. But this is exactly what I, my programs combine kettlebell training with Olympic lifting. Uh, the goblet squat is a wonderful warm up for the Olympic lifts. The uh, the swing is a so uh, if I'm preparing for weightlifting meet like I'm doing right now, eight weeks. Uh, the swing can be a very good way to help me burn body fat or after a weightlifting meet, kind of keep my hinge going. Yeah, there's there's some value here. Jack, I, I hate to have such a short question. Go to the forum, read my workouts, and I think I answer your question, okay? Thank you. Got a question here from Thomas. Most recently, my 53-year-old father talked me talked to me about his shoulder pain and that he sometimes can't even use his arms properly anymore 53 uh that just sparks up some issues with me thomas that's i know that things break but that's okay he has always had slight problems with his shoulder but no actual injuries just not moving enough okay i would like to introduce him to hanging regularly but he's fairly overweight oh boy bad shoulders overweight i don't know if i can do more harm than good He's 5'7", around 100K, 220. Never done strength training, but kind of naturally strong with a stocky frame. If hanging would be out of the question, what would you recommend instead? Well, I, geez, I, I first off, uh, since you use kilos, have him see a physio about his shoulders. Maybe there's a couple exercises. Like um, Mike has me do like the touchdowns, you know, this thing here. Boy, that is just a miracle worker. When I first started doing it, every time I do it, you hear this clunk, 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 and I don't hear it anymore. And I'm assuming that's good. Uh, see a physio, see if you can get an exercise or two. And then we need to talk to your dad about uh, the not training, the overweight, and the shoulders. Because here's the deal, Thomas, and God bless you for being a good son. It ain't going to get better. You know, there's no magic of all of a sudden he's going to wake up one day and be 22 again, okay? So um, let's have the shoulders looked at, and then let's get him doing things like walking in some basic repair, okay? Well, there you go. Thanks, everybody, for being here once again. Um, episode 125 is in the books. Uh, remember, if you have questions, and uh, I will gladly answer each and every one, remember to email me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'm happy to answer each and every one. Reminder, new year, one word, discount code on the site. And remember the new course on Game Changers is out and hopefully as the year goes by, we're thinking of having three, uh, three Game Changers course in total. But number one is ready and available at danjohnuniversity.com. And thank you. And until next time, Keep on lifting and learning.